And that leads us also right away to our first speaker, to Cornelia Parker. Cornelia told me this morning that uh, when she met Gustav for the first time, more than 20 years ago, he told her we have to talk about destruction. Uh, Cornelia will today present a talk entitled How a Tirade, and uh, she has throughout her work dealt with issue of destruction in her installations. Uh, she's also worked a lot with bridging the disciplines, is at the moment working on an extraordinary project um, for Manchester together with the scientist Kostya Novoselov, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering this material graphene, which is this very thin, unbelievably thin, atomically thin, low weight, unbelievably strong material. And she and uh, Kostya are working on a work right now where they use fragments of drawings of Blake and make uh, and, and other artists that make new works out of this. Of course, uh, Cornelia has had two exhibitions here at the Serpentine Galleries, and we are extremely excited that she's here with us today. A very, very warm welcome to Cornelia Parkon. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, when I was asked to speak at this conference, I thought, how can I possibly respond to such a huge subject? Um, uh, <laughs> this is my, a piece of my work 30 years ago, which is called Drown Monuments, and it's my bath water that's deluged, uh, you know, Empire State and all kinds of other famous places. Um, and this was, I suppose, being brought up in the countryside, I was really very concerned about ecological issues quite early on. Um, but like all of us, you know, I lived in a state of denial and still, to a certain extent, do. But now I think we haven't got time for denial. You know, we haven't got time for that. Um, um, in 2005, I went to a conference which was hosted by uh, Oxford University climate scientists, uh, inviting people from the creative community to come and talk to them about extinction, basically, about human extinction, because that's what I'm talking about today, not animal extinction, because we all know that's happening. But people can't believe that we might become extinct very soon, which is certainly could happen perhaps in my daughter's lifetime. Um, so that is a very troubling thing as a mother. Um, and so this conference, uh, which one's a conference? It's like a workshop, a series of speakers um, having one-to-one -one discussions with um, climate scientists. Um, and they were saying, we need you. We need you, the artists. We need you, the, the writers. Uh, Ian McCune was there. Philip Pullman was there. Um, Charlotte, um, uh, Carol Churchill was there. There was all kinds of people from the creative community. And we all kind of vaguely knew something terrible was happening. But they were saying, we know this awful thing. We know this thing that that we're really on this destruction path that you know, nobody's listening to us, the politicians aren't listening to us, um, the corporations are nobbling all our climate um, talks, um, and we need a way of getting this out to the people that's not necessarily just about the media or about the lack of media. Since then, there has been a hell of a lot of media about this. You know, people seem to, you know, the, every day we have the newspaper tell us that we're at the edge of this precipice, but we all carry on as normal, you know, it's just, you know, most people haven't done anything to change their lives. Um, I went and talked to Noam Chomsky. I made a piece called Chomsky in Abstract in 2007 because I thought, how can I understand this? I knew it was about capitalism. I knew it was about the fact we're all consumed too much. And I thought he might know. He hadn't really talked too much about climate change then. Um, but I thought, you know, him being one of the most intelligent people in the world might be able to answer some of my questions. Um, and the piece is called Chomsky in Abstract, and it's on YouTube if you want to see it. But it's a 42-minute dialogue about him describing how we got to this point because I was trying to understand uh, how we got to this point how we the most intelligent people you know we, we're not animals we have a consciousness we we can choose which way we go could get to this point so all I could do was think of a tirade um, this is me <laughs> in 2001 was um, giving birth at 45 to my only child um, as Julie will remember, coming to see me in the hospital, um, Lily. Um, and then I was blissfully ign ignorant. This was a time when I hadn't discovered that her future was going to be in jeopardy. I thought climate change was way down the line. I thought it was 500 years away or 1,000 years away. This is her on her second birthday, and you can see she's really worrying about climate change. <laughs> um, this is her, at her first day at school in Montessori in America, where we were uh, when she was two and a half. Um, little rain cloud there over her head, um, looking very optimistic about the future. 
This is her at her uh, was it her fourth or fifth birthday. <laughs> still optimistic, still got red hair. And this is her on our roof uh, after I've been to this climate uh, conference. Um, we put solar panels up. We changed our energy to good energy, which is 100% renewable. We made sure that we hadn't got any investments in any fossil fuels, only in sustainable things. So we did what we could with, you know, even you know, our day-to-day -day lives, and we make sure we could be as green as possible, offset all our flights everywhere. Um, we were early adopters of solar, you know, and, uh, and now you can, you can put solar on your, um, you know, your house and get feed-in tariffs. They wouldn't allow people who were early adopters to get feed-in tariffs. We grew our own vegetables on the roof. Um, some of them were a bit mutant. <laughs> Um, you know, we, our weathers have got more and more extreme, you know. This is Lily battling with um, giant snowballs um, in June. <laughs> no, it wasn't in June. Uh, <laughs> but it could be in June in the future. There's all kinds of things happening. In Mecca, they were saying it was raining when the, it was 107 degrees. So we have some very strange weather. Um, at this environmental conference, I met um, a wonderful climate scientist around the, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change, John Schellenhuber, who is actually um, Andrew Merkel's um, climate advisor, and largely why she has disinvested over the years in, um, you know, nuclear and, and you know, she's got 25% renewable energy there in Germany, um, and they're just ploughing on, and they'll become more and more green. Um, you know, almost alone in the world in taking on that responsibility. Um, and when I spoke to him last, a couple of years ago, I asked him what, you know, what's our, you know, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And he said, well, actually, we're having this very weird little moment at the moment with our weather, which is stable for a while, although it doesn't feel very stable. He said, you know, three or four years, we're going to, the shit is really going to hit the fan. We're going to have terrible storms, terrible hurricanes. We're going to have droughts. We're going to have landslips. We're going to have... Um, um, you know, earthquakes in places you don't normally have earthquakes. Um, and how is our government responding to this? They've just allowed 60% of Britain to be put up for fracking. You know, they say, you, although it's been banned in Germany and France and other European countries, they've said, they said please come and frack us, um, you know, for fossil fuels. We've got graphene invented by Kostya Nosolov and Andre Gim up in Manchester on our soil. This is, this, this is what people from all over the world are fighting for patents for this stuff. You know, they, and we've got about 21 patents. You know, China's got like over 1,000 um, of what this material can do. What it can do is replace um, silicon in solar. It can charge up your car in five minutes rather than hours. It can, it, it's, you know, immensely strong. Uh, it could be used for, uh, it's transparent. Um, and it can, you know, we've got it. It's been invented here. And what's happened? Um, they built a new graphene center up in Manchester, and the government said we've put 50 million towards um, graphene, but actually, it's most of it's come from the U European Union to build this nice center. And everywhere else around the world, they're all you know working on this. So we don't need to frack for fossil fuels. We've got enough stuff out there that works. The only thing that's stopping it working is there's no lobbyists for that. You know, we have lobbyists for fossil fuels. So, so really, the fossil fuel guys have all got children. <laughs> they've all um, they've all gone, hoped to have grandchildren. Perhaps they've got grandchildren, but they keep on coming. You know, they keep on um, you know sort of um, wanting their profits. And now, what's happening? Hopefully, will happen. <laughs> is I think Glasgow University is the first university to, to de-invest in fossil fuels. If every university and every big institution stopped, did that tomorrow, you know, made steps towards it, then those companies would be losing revenue and all the, the, um, the, the subsidies, which are millions to the fossil fuels, would go to renewables. Um, and because, you know, the investments of our pensions and our, um, our universities, you know, they say your pensions for when you have time to enjoy yourself. You won't have any enjoyable time if you're battling all these terrible situations. Um, the students won't be having a good time because they will have no future. So why are these universities invested in fossil fuel? So I think we need to, every single person to, to kind of think about where your money is, if you've got some money, <laughs> where your energy comes from. If you've uh, got 100% renewable energy tomorrow, by changing to Good Energy or one of the other companies, you, you know, they will have to provide you with renewable energy and not with fossil fuel energy. So we can do things. We don't have to sit around waiting for the end. Um, uh, this is us in a, a Parisian park 
um, you know, when Lily was about six, and we were looking at this lump on a tree, which we didn't know what it was. We thought it might be our future or a growth. Uh, this is in New Zealand, and the, the, <laughs> the problem's grown to enormous proportions, and this is some kind of weird tree fungi that's, you know, uh, blighting this forest. It just seemed like a perfect um, analogy for what's happening at the moment and what Lily's future might be like. Uh, we've got UKIP talking about immigration. We're going to have a hell of a lot more immigrants coming into England because of they're going to be climate refugees very quickly. So there's going to be a lot less uh, land for us to occupy. Them. Um, so, um, and John Schoenhuber, the, the climate scientist I met, wanted to uh, start... Um, a Manhattan project. We had a Manhattan project during the World, Second World War to, um, you know, to, to, to make an atom bomb so we could stop the war because we thought the Germans were doing that. So we thought we'd get there first. And, and, and in wartime, we actually get a lot done. Inventions happen. Okay, the atom bomb was a pretty hideous thing, um, but it showed that some, you know, when you attack a problem really concentratedly with an urgency of life or death, you can make things happen. So wartime is where all these great inventions happened. I think we need to put this on a war footing. You know, I think climate change, extinction should be on a war footing from now on because that's where we're at. Otherwise, business as usual will all be, you know, our children and grandchildren will have no future at all. Um, I promise you a tirade. <laughs> I, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a statistician, I'm not a writer, um, uh, I'm an artist, and I made that particular piece, The Chomsky Abstract, which is me trying to take it head on, as, almost as a piece of propaganda, because I thought, what can I do as an artist? You know, I, I'm a citizen, I'm a concerned citizen, and I'm an out, you know, the moral outrage of what's happening is just too, too much to, to cope with. Um, you know, they say that we, we can, you know, safely um, allow the temperature of the Earth to rise to two degrees. We can't. You know, we're most probably more or less at that now. We're only 0.7 or 0.8 degrees, but without us doing anything, it will carry on and it will become two degrees very quickly. And Mark Linus wrote this brilliant book about six degrees of warming. And if you look at what he says about two degrees, you really realise two degrees is not a very comfortable place to be. So um, I suggest you read that. If you haven't already, I'm sure you have. Um, you know, what about plastic bags? <laughs> All that fuss about plastic bags a few years ago, is exactly, we're back, exactly in the same position now we were then. All that fuss, all that... They could, the government could have just said, right, we can't use plastic bags unless it's biodegradable. They could have done that overnight by a stroke of a pen. Why didn't they do it? If they can't even do that for plastic bags, what's going to happen, you know, with, with anything else? Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of... I'm, I'm constantly reading about new energy sources, you know, that hemp or rhubarb can be a place where you can store energy. So scientists are working away on all these wonderful new energy forms. And I think that's where our future lies. We just need to get those things up and running. And why aren't they up and running? It's just investments and subsidies. That's what they need. Um, you know, we have the permafrost. Um, this is the thing that chilled me the most about my talking to scientists. They said, well, you know, we, we have got a very finite, you know, tiny, we have, have a very small bandwidth of time to deal with this because what happens when we thaw out uh, two degrees will happen um, the permafrost which which is um, in in up in the e, you know Greenland um, has got all kinds of pathogens in it it's got old diseases in it <laughs> you know we've got Ebola but we might have, have a hell of a lot of other things coming out Me it's releasing methane as we speak methane is much worse than co2 um, so you know, if that goes run away, we, we might as well forget about all our little gestures, I think. Um, and to stop that, we just have to do something very, um, you know, we need to, to all act tomorrow, not next week or three weeks or five weeks. We need to do something about that. Um, you know, thorium, you know, there's a, a thing rather than uranium that we can use in nuclear power that's not so toxic, and it, it could have easily been used years ago, but uranium, they used uranium because they can make weapons out of it. They can't make weapons out of thorium. So you could have uh, a thorium-driven car that would be perpetually, you know, it could go for 200 years. Um, um, the, with things like graphene, you could make um, perpetual motion cars. Um, we don't need to have fossil fuels. The only reason we... We, we're talking about fossil fuels is because they become the most powerful people in the world, the people who have those profits. But we need to keep as much fossil fuel on the ground. There's five times more fossil fuel in the ground 
then we can safely burn. And we, we, we really need to not burn anymore if we can help it. We're all guilty. We've all perhaps got cars or fly or whatever. But we should all do something to show that we're not happy with the world order. Um, you know, things of, you know, we might not have bananas in the very near future. Bananas are under threat. <laughs> uh, limes are under threat. Talk about extinctions of animals and people. We're, you know, you're going to find certain staples are going to drop off very, you know, quite suddenly because um, where they grow is not got the right conditions anymore. Um, I mean, Chomsky, um, he's now very much involved with climate um, climate change. Um, he's um, and he's passed the, the baton on to uh, Naomi Klein. So I, I, I don't know if you've read her latest book, uh, This Changes Everything, but she's, it's brilliant. She's put down on paper all the, how we got to this point, which is very hard to understand, but where we have to go from here. She, like me, is a mother, a recent mother, so she, she has a vested interest. Um, so I suggest, if you haven't read it, to read it and pass it on to all your friends. <laughs> um, Chomsky says, we need to ensure that the perverse short-term incentives for maximising profits will not end up making otherwise good people make bad choices that can lead to the destruction of our planet. People need to take a clear-eyed look at the world around us and where it's going, where it is likely to go. If we remain passive and obedient and conformist, then we face an intolerable life followed by extinction. <laughs> That's me over. <laughs>